thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, why should we care about um, functional programming? Um, first of all, we can say because it's possible. Um, so even if C++ is mainly or has a strong focus on object orientation, it's also very flexible and it allows us to use different styles as well. Um, then there are benefits which I would call te technical benefits. Um, for example, in concurrent uh, programming, it turns out that um, objects are not always the best choice because they have state and they hide, they might hide important things that can lead to data races. Um, but what I want to focus in this talk mainly on is that um, functional programming allows us to write very expressive code. And with this, you get the usual benefits. Your code will be easier to read, easier to read and maintain and easier to test. And um, with this, of course, you gain productivity. So to summarize, you could say basically that functional programming is really beautiful. And uh, yeah, in this talk, I want to focus on three very basic concepts of functional programming that we can easily apply in C++. And um, yeah, the first one um, has also to do with uh, beautiful things like um, diamonds, because functional programs are not only beautiful, they are also rock solid like diamonds. You probably all know the saying, uh, a diamond is const, and so are functional programs, because we have no variables in, in the functional world, we have only constants. This can easily be achieved in C++. We just use const for every variable declaration. And if you want to be really sure, then we can also use um, compile time calculations. Um, yeah. And the benefits are well known, I think. So first of all, it simplifies um, and to understand uh, your yeah, reasoning about the code and debugging. And then it also reduces the risk of introducing errors because we cannot accidentally overwrite um, values. Um, and then it also encourages meaningful variable names. I will have an example what I mean uh, later on, what I mean with this. And uh, a special benefit in C++ is that the compiler can perform optimization. Okay, let's have a look at an example uh, where we deal with mutable or const variables. So um, here in, at LockMeIn, we deal a lot with uh, media streams, with components that receive media streams from, from the network. And now imagine we have um, a component that receives such, such a media stream in form of packets. And this component is updated uh, with the timestamp of each incoming packet. And now I want to write a test case for this component to see how it behaves. Oh, it was one too fast. Okay, to see how it behaves. Um, yeah, uh, when it sees a certain sequence of packets, and then I might come up with such an implementation. So here, uh, first of all, I define here this receiver. Uh, I create a receiver object, and then I um, create my initial timestamp. I uh, update the receiver with this timestamp. And then I assert something, maybe something on the state or whatever. And then I increase the timestamp a little bit to simulate the next incoming packet. I push again, update my object again, assert, and so on. So with this, of course, um, I, I can easily simulate a simple packet sequence. But um, there are some downsides to this approach. So first of all, um, yeah, it's hard to, to um, see the, the actual sequence that is being tested by with just a quick uh, look at the code. You really have to go in the details and read the whole test to figure out the sequence. And then it's also hard to debug because um, this timestamp here is constantly overwritten. So it, it changes um, its value all the time. And this is, of course, something which is kind of the, I would say, the, the root cause of, um, of these uh, drawbacks that, that this approach has. So if I try instead to, to use uh, constant variables, then I might come up with a different solution. Um, so the obvious thing to do is here then to just use an array for my timestamps. 
um, and define the whole sequence up front. And this I can then also make const. And then I also maybe need to um, define my expectations up front corresponding to the simulated packets. And then I can use, for example, this boost for each algorithm that allows me to iterate in parallel over two containers to then um, play, play back the sequence and um, simulate yeah, the whole sequence. So um, yeah, by trying to introducing constants, um, I, I might be pushed to think about such solutions, which also have some nice benefits, uh, some yeah, additional benefits, like um, here in this case, if you try to uh, structure your your test cases in, in the canonical way, where you have the uh, three uh, separate phases, the arrange, act, and assert phase, then we clearly see that in in this implementation, we have at least the arrange phase clearly separated from the rest of the test case. Okay, um, the next example is a bit more uh, academic one, maybe. So, um, but it's also something that appears very often where we have um, some conditional calculation. So we have here a function that takes some input. And uh, now it does some very complicated calculation or whatever here, and assigns this value then to a variable which is called result. Um, but if we have a special condition, then this result will be modified a bit further. And I mean, it is very simple example. This is probably okay. But uh, the issue that I see here with this code is, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the variable naming basically, because uh, obviously once this line here has been executed, uh, the variable result contains a value which is not really the result of the function, or we don't know yet whether it's the result, because it might be modified later on. This is even more obvious if you have an else branch here that also modifies somehow the result further. So the naming here is not really precise. And if I uh, stick to using const variables only, then I am forced uh, to introduce an additional variable. Then I, and I have to give two different names. And of course, I mean, I still have to think about meaningful names, but uh, I'm pushed maybe in the direction of doing this. And uh, yeah, whether these names are meaningful, it's, it's another story, but this is how it can then look like. So I can call this this first um, value here prelim preliminary result. And then here I use this ternary operator to produce the final result of my function. And um, of course, if, if this expression here is more complicated um, and I cannot use just this ternary operator, then I can um, put it into a separate function. Okay, so much for the rock solid diamonds, um, but there are more commonalities between diamonds and functional programming because diamonds are very pure and so are functions in the, in the functional world. A pure function is a function that has no side effects. Uh, this is kind of a prototype of a pure function. F, it takes some input and produces some output. Um, yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to take any input, but it has to produce some output because otherwise there would be no reason to call it if it has no side effects. Pure doesn't mean necessarily that you can't have objects. Um, you can also have pure member functions. Uh, they have to be const, that's basically all. So if I have a const object and I'm um, uh, calling then a const member function on this, this can also be pure. Um, and this is in contrast to uh, uh, yeah, normal member function like this one, which is obviously only called for its side effects. So this, this guy will modify the state of the object. Okay, benefits of um, pure functions um, are, of course, that they are very expressive. Um, when I use a, um, a non-pure function like this one, then I have only the name of the function to give me an idea about what the function is doing. But if I use such a function, then I also have the signature of the function, which can also give me an, a hint about what the function is doing and yeah, support the name basically in um, 
to, to guess the meaning. Then um, pure functions are de deterministic, so they will always produce the same output when they are um, when I use the same input because there's no state involved. And uh, this also makes them very easy to test because I don't have to set up some complicated states. Um, as a side remark, there is also an, a pretty old article by Scott Myers about uh, how non-member, non-friend functions can improve encapsulation. So this article doesn't focus so much on, on pure functions. Um, it's more about encapsulation. But in the end, it also means um, you should prefer free functions. And once you have a free function, you are already pretty close to, to a pure function, I would say. Yeah, and he has devised some algorithm that helped us to, to find out whether we need a member function uh, or a free function or whatever. Okay, um, I have one example for uh, the benefits of pure function, which I stole from uh, from Upside, from the Upside library tips, tip of the week. Um, in this, uh, this tip is actually uh, concerned with um, writing test cases. And um, here the task is to write um, some test cases for a very simple class uh, called Frobber that has two uh, methods, an initialization method and some calculate method. And then um, because it's uh, the upside library, it uses the, the gtest framework, uh, but it's similar with other frameworks. Um, the gtest framework allows you to, to define test fixtures, basically a, um, yeah, a class that gives you that gives some context to the test, allows you to define some setup or teardown methods that are called for each test case. And in the first approach, um, test cases are now implemented using such a test fixture. And uh, we will first, but first have a look only at the, at the test cases uh, and not yet look at the fixture itself. So to see how much we can actually understand by only looking at the test cases. So we have two test cases here, some A scenario and some B scenario. And then, um, yeah, they look pretty similar. And if you look closer uh, at the first one, then we see we call here some, probably some setup method for this test case. This is probably a member function of the fixture because it takes no input, it produces no output. So it probably changes the state of the fixture. And then we call the method that we actually want to test. And then we verify the result about against some, yeah, some variables that we also don't know. So from the, from just looking at the test case itself, it's pretty difficult to see what's going on. Um, so here we, we basically have to look at the test fixture to get more information and um, because the, yeah, a lot of the info, important information is hidden there actually. So this is the test fixture. Um, it has three member uh, variables here that are also used in the, in the test cases. And uh, so the frobber that we want to test and then um, the input basically and the expected output. And these configure methods are just used to initialize these members. So this is basically an example for using a, a non-pure function here. And uh, we can see that yeah, a lot is hidden from us if we use this approach and we have to, to um, scroll around in the code and yeah, look at other places to, to figure out what's going on. So can we do better? So what about if we uh, write these test cases without using a test fixture? Then it can look like this. So we have the two test cases again. And now we are using here um, a factory function to create um, this proper object that we want to test. And then it's pretty similar. We just um, call the API and uh, verify the result. But now the, the crucial difference here is that in this case, test case, I have all the inf important information available. I see the input, the state that I want to, uh, that I want my, my test object to be in. I see also how my test object is actually created, more or less at least. And I also see the expected um, result of the test. And for this, I don't even have to look in detail at this factory function, how it looks like. Um, I already get a much better idea of what's going on. So uh, the factory function is of course uh, pretty similar 
to to this initialization method. Yeah. Okay. So much for um, pure functions. And now, um, yeah, the third and uh, major um, concept basically um, that I want to talk about in functional program programming is how to work uh, on or with arrays in in the functional world. Because um, in the in the functional world we don't have for loops, so this is pretty different from uh, what we are what we might be used from C or C plus um, plus. In yeah, functional languages you can use recursion to work with arrays, or probably um, the preferred way is to use um, higher order algorith algorithms. These are uh, functions which take other functions as parameters. And there um, are quite a few um, well-known or popular uh, higher order algorithms. Um, so for example, we have the map algorithm, which is used to transform some input array into some output um, array. Um, then we have the fold or reduce algorithm, which will basically sum up an, uh, an array to a single value. And then there are all kinds of different um, yeah, algorithms, basically, for example, to, to find certain values in the array or to filter out a range or whatever. And all these algorithms are available in C++ in, in the, most of them in the algorithm header, some in the numeric header. And um, yeah, we can use them right away. Um, there are actually um, even some more specialized algorithms, like for example, this replace algorithm that allows us to replace um, only yeah, uh, specified values in an array. Okay, this is how it looks like when we um, use uh, such an algorithm here. As an example, I, I use the transform algorithm um, to, to map this function f over an input array. Um, the benefit yeah, of this approach of using algorithms is of course again um, expressiveness. Um, you can consider them to be specialized for loops. Uh, so whenever I see such an algorithm in the code, I already get um, uh, some clue about what, what's going to happen, what kind of transformation operation is going on. In contrast to when I see a for loop, it could be anything. Then um, another, another uh, thing with for loops is that they um, tend to grow over time and become more complex. You can add um, yeah, branches inside the for loop and then uh, do a lot of, oper of, of different operations in a single for loop. And uh, this is something that algorithms um, prevent or, or it's easier, I think, to, to um, avoid this with, when you use algorithms because they enforce basically to um, use a specialized, a specialized algorithm for a specialized operation. And then um, since you have to supply the loop body in form of a function, you also get a reusable loop body. But um, there are also some um, issues with the current state of these algorithms in, in the uh, standard library. So uh, one is this iterator-based interface. So when I uh, want to transform my input array or container, then I cannot just plug in the input container, but I have to use these two iterators, which is a bit cumbersome. And then um, the, from a functional perspective, the more serious issue is that these algorithms are impure. Um, so this means, uh, this is because I have to to supply the, the result container as a parameter. So that's an out parameter. And that means I cannot make it const. And it also means uh, I cannot easily compose algorithms. Um, yeah, because this algorithm doesn't does not return its result as a return value, which I could directly plug into some other function. But uh, fortunately, there are also ways to, to overcome these issues. Um, and this is uh, can be done with ranges. Uh, ranges will be part of the C++ standard uh, 
P plan plus 20. Um, but already now we can use ranges. There are different range libraries available, um, which are pretty, which all are pretty similar um, regarding the concepts, I would say, and in you know, at least the ones I know. And um, for this talk, I want to focus on the boost range library. Um, the boost range library overcomes these two issues. First, by uh, introducing um, yeah, alternatives for the algorithms. We have basically in the range library a replacement for every standard algorithm with a um, more convenient interface, which looks like, like so. So if I use the boost transform algorithm, I can, as, as I wanted earlier, just use the input container here and don't have to provide the two iterators. So this will already reduce the the, the line length a bit, but then there is more. Um, the second and maybe more important point is that the range library uh, provides so-called adapters. In the new C++ uh, standard, they will be called views, and this will make um, the uh, the algorithms composable. How does this work? Or how does it look like? When it's applied, um, then I use this special pipe operator here, and this allows me to, to pipe my input container into some adapter. And this whole construction then, um, so this here would replace every two by a five in the input container. And the result of this operation, I can then further uh, pipe into the transformed uh, adapter, which is just a mapping operation. And in the end, um, I can assign the whole thing to this output, uh, oh, okay, output, um, yeah, container or output range. Okay, this is now actually a range. I will um, say a bit more about what a uh, what a range um, uh, is later on. Yeah. Um, okay, and with this we solve the second problem. And now to make this table complete, as I said. We have in the range library a replacement for every standard algorithm. And what I wrote in, in italic here, we also have additionally these adapters, which I can use uh, in, uh, yeah, in place of the algorithms. Or sometimes uh, we also have adapters where we didn't have an algorithm before. OK, and uh, now I'd like to show some examples uh, for how we can use ranges. Um, I switch to the editor for this. Okay, so um, just to get an uh, overview again about the different concepts. Um, so I want to um, now just uh, yeah to start as a very, very simple example. So I, I have an input array, a simple input array, and now I, I want to map this function over this array. And using um, standard algorithms, it would look like this. So I have to um, define my um, output container up front, and then I have to provide these two iterators. Using um, the boost ranges, I this code gets a bit nicer already. So I don't have to provide the iterators anymore. And finally, the best solution, of course, is using these uh, adapters. Then I can reduce the whole thing to one line. OK, so then a more practical example. Um, yeah, let's go back to the scenario um, with, uh, where we um, considered media streams that we re receive from, from the network. And now imagine um, that we have a sequence of packets again with timestamps and we want to calculate um, the difference between timestamps of um, consecutive packets. So this is the function that I would like to implement. It's called calculate timestamp deltas between packets and the input that I get is a vector of shared pointer packets. So what is a packet actually? Uh, you can have a look in, into the definition. So a packet consists here of um, a meta info 
it's, it's just a simple structure consists of a meta info and some payload and the meta info again uh, for this simple example can, uh, is just a sequence number and the timestamp so this is so the timestamp is what i eventually need to to uh, implement this function and um, so as a first step um, i would like to extract the meter information from the packets because the meter information contains the timestamp and i can do this using the um, transformed adapter so i'm just piping this packet vector into the transformed adapter and inside this transformed adapter i'm just picking the meter info from every packet but actually it doesn't work this way um, directly because I'm using the dot here to access the meter info but the input is actually um, a shared pointer here we have a shared packet pointer so I would need to use the arrow at this point um, but what I can also do is I don't have to do this myself because uh, there is a specialized adapter for this so I can use uh, this indirected adapter and oh I but we one operator too many okay and this indirected adapter will dereference every element in the container for me so i don't have to do this myself uh, <clears throat> okay so the next step is then i've i've now um, a range of meter infos the next step would be now to extract all the timestamps from the meter informations and for this i basically do the same thing again i use the meter infos here and uh, pipe them into the transformed adapter and pick the timestamp from every meter information. And now um, I've created a container of timestamps. Now it's pretty simple to solve, uh, to finish this uh, function. Now I can just use a dedicated algorithm to uh, calculate this deltas. We have this adjacent difference algorithm in the library which will exactly do what i need and yeah with this i'm done basically so um uh, um oh i'm i'm not sure but i'm assume it doesn't check yeah so it is i mean that's in the end uh if your packets are yeah Um, okay, but um, because these adapters compose, um, or, or, or no, let me start. Uh, so I, I defined now these um, basically these uh, intermediate results here to uh, develop this function step by step. But since um, the adapters compose, I actually don't need these intermediate steps. So I can basically just take this expression here and replace the variable by this expression and i can then okay i left the semicolon here so still not what is missing i, I think it's just this stuff here so okay yeah and um similar i can also take this stuff and directly plug it into the algorithm here and then I've basically produced, um, okay, I forgot again, semicolon here. So like so, now I've reduced um, without line length limitation, I would have reduced the function to a three liner. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, but uh, no, seriously, I mean, if you, uh, now it's still pretty long because I'm using all this namespace stuff here. So if I, um, uh, instead use some using um, declarations here i can really reduce it a bit further yeah so this boost adapter stuff is gone here and then i might also see that um, i'm doing pretty similar things here in these two transformed adapters each time i'm basically um, extracting a member of a struct so this could also be a point for for abstraction so i can use um i can introduce 
a, function, a generic function which does this. So this is the plug function. This will basically extract, um, without going into the details, it will extract um, yeah, a member from a struct. And the, the important point that I want to show here is that um, it returns this adapter. And I can now use it in uh, just as if it was an adapter, basically. So the code will then look like this. So I have here uh, the indirected adapter again, and then now I pipe it into this plugged function, kind of. But of course, it's the function is actually returning the the um, transformed adapter. And now, at least, I mean, maybe now one could argue that you could leave it in one line. Okay. So much for this example. Um, yeah, what's the next example? I would like it's a more it's again a bit more an academic one. I would like to to show some fundamental differences that we have between algorithms and um, adapters. And uh, basically, it's it's meant to show that um, container uh, algorithms do ego evaluation, while uh, adapters do lazy evaluation. And for this, um, I start again with a simple input array. And I want to map now two functions over this in input array um, consecutively. So uh, the details are, again, not so important. The important uh, thing is that the first function that I will map over this array, this one will modify this global state here to produce its uh, output. And the second function, will only read the global state and use it to produce its output. And then I also have a um, composed version of these two where I just apply them consecutively in one lambda. Okay, let's see now how um, this works using um, algorithms. I'm going to use the, the boost algorithms directly here. Uh, in terms of evaluation, they are, um, uh, they are Basically, they, they work the same way as the standard algorithms. So in the first uh, version here, I use the transform algorithm twice and apply the two lambdas separately. And in the second version here, I use the transform algorithm once and but use the composed lambda. Okay, and now um, finally, I'm going to print the result. Uh, is done here these lines okay and uh, now I have to hope that it builds and runs okay but before I run it uh, does anyone want to guess what the result will be so the important question is here will it give the same result or will the two uh, calculations be different anyone <laughs> Okay, so I just uh, run it. Okay, we see for if we apply them separately, we give it, get a different result than when we use the composed version. So why is this so? Uh, well, the reason is, um, or it has to do with the order of, of execution. When we apply the lambda separately, um, we will apply, we will call the first lambda three times in a row and then we will call the second lambda three times in a row. This means each time the second lambda is called, it will see the same global state because the global state is not touched anymore. Only the first lambda is modifying the global state. However, if I use this composed version here, then I have actually alternating calls of first and second lambda. So this means always when I call the second lambda, the previous previously I just called the first lambda and the first lambda just modified my global state. So each time the second lambda is called, it, it sees a different global state. And yeah, that's the reason why we get different results. Okay, how does it look like if we use um, adapters instead? So we do exactly the same again. Here I have, uh, um, yeah, in the first, here we have the first version where I use transformed adapter twice. Oh, it's not fitting. Okay, I think you can see. Okay, it's the second lambda here. 
and then I use it only once with the proposed uh, lambda. And now, okay, does anyone now want to guess what the result will be? Will it be the same or not? Okay, I just run it. Okay, this time we get the same uh, for, in, for the lazy version, the same result. So and the reason for this is actually that um, adapters are lazy, which means uh, once this, this line of code here has been executed, no calculation has been done so far. With this, I'm just creating a range, an adapted range, this lazy separately, and this range is just a pair of iterators, and no lambda has been called so far. And only once I start to dereference uh, these iterators, once I start to iterate over the range, which I'm doing, doing down here, the lambdas will be called. And since we are piping the stuff here, we will um, yeah, have the same order of execution as as if uh, I, I would use this composed lambda. So uh, I try to um, draw a, a small picture for this um, to maybe this helps to understand the difference. So um, okay. So uh, when I apply the algorithm, then the execution basically looks like this. So I really create uh, another array after applying the another container after applying the first lambda, and again another array after applying the second lambda. And in the end, when I print the stuff, then I have um, iterators pointing to the already transformed values. And if I use the adapter instead, then the picture looks more like like so. So the the uh, um, iterators that I use to print the values, they still point to my initial input array, but the lambdas are now part of the iterators. So when I want to get um, a value from, from my input array by dereferencing these iterators, then this value has to go through the lambdas before I get it. And this is why um, yeah, we have the same order of execution, no matter whether I apply them separately, the lambdas, or um, whether I I use this composed lambda. Okay, I have one more example, or is there any questions? Oh, then I have one more uh, more involved example using um, um, ranges and adapters from yeah a more practical example maybe. So here I would like to calculate a cumulative distribution function from a histogram. So um, on the left-hand side, we can see the histogram, um, simple histogram, and the cumulative distribu distribution function of this histogram is again a histogram, and it's just uh, kind of the, the running integral. So the, the last bin will then uh, be, will contain the sum of all the bins in the initial histogram. This is the cumulative distribution function. Okay, uh, let me switch back. Okay, so oh, sorry. Okay, um, so we start with uh, a simple implementation using a for loop. So, okay, so we have um, basically the histogram defined as um, as a map, as a standard map, where the keys are the bin positions and the values are yeah, the bin um, values. And then we start with this implementation here using a for loop. So it's a bit more involved. So I'm trying to go through it step by step. So first of all, maybe we can ignore this offset. So we see we are creating the CDF um, as an empty histogram as a first step. And then we have here a histogram sum so this will probably uh, be this running sum uh, over all the bins. And then we enter the for loop. So here we are now um, really iterating over this input histogram. And now we are checking each bin somehow. There's some if branch here, which will which contains a continue. So maybe we, we are not taking this bin actually. But if we if we consider this bin further, then we update the sum 
and then we finally assign to this to the CDF that is prob will probably be our result, and we assign this the current value of the sum, and we do something else here. Actually, we are not uh, just copying the the bin position here, but we are shifting the bin position a little bit by some offset. And then finally, yeah, we return the the fact the CDF here. So um, yeah, in summary, this for loop actually does uh, three operations at once. So first of all, we have in this if, if branch, this is actually a filter operation because we are not considering all the values apparently because some are just skipped. Then we have this uh, summing operation, which is kind of an accumulation, accumulate operation. Of in, in functional terms, it's a fault operation. And then we have this shifting of the keys, which is a simple transformation at the end. And uh, yeah, now I would like to try to um, extract these uh, three steps into into separate algorithms. So as a first um, step, we can uh, try to extract uh, this uh, filter operation. But okay, before I do this, I just want to show that it works actually. So I have a simple rename this back to lazy. Okay, now I have a simple um, uh, yeah, histogram defined here to exercise this function. So it has just three bins at position two, three, and four with different values. And then I apply the uh, transformation to the CDF and I, I print it. And let's see the output. So the output is now, uh, so the, the, the positions are now shifted. So initially we start with position two, but the output is actually position one. So we shift them all by one. And um, okay, and we also see the accumulation here of the um, of the bin values. Can I get this? Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, it works. Now let's try to use ranges to um, implement this function. So in the first step, I would like to um, actually extract this filter operation. And this can be done with this filter algorithm, a uh, filter adapter here. So, um, and uh, what remains then from the histogram, um, I will call a histogram with strictly positive bins because this was actually the condition that we used. So we only want to keep uh, bins that are larger than zero. And uh, in the previous implementation in this for loop, we also had this um, Boolean flag here which was used to issue some warning in case that uh, we have some negative bins in the histogram. And I can do this, reproduce this now by just comparing the sizes of the two histograms. So if my filtered histogram is smaller than the initial histogram, then apparently I found uh, something which was uh, smaller, a uh, zero or smaller. Okay, and then um, in the next step, I can now, um, I will leave the, the rest for now in, in one operation, basically. So um, I'm using now the, the transformed adapter and um, have uh, inside this transformed adapter, I'm, I'm now summing up the values again, similar to, to the previous version with the for loop. And finally, I'm uh, doing the shift of the keys here when returning the the values, uh, the yeah, when returning the pairs, or I'm returning pairs here because in the end, the CDF is again a map, and um, a map is an array of pairs. And then finally, to convert this range that I'm creating here into into a standard map, I'm using this copy range function, and um, this will then uh, convert here the range into a histogram, which is specified here. Okay, we can briefly um, try out this code. Okay, it still gives the same result. And okay, I'm seeing it's getting late already. So I have some intermediate steps still in this conversion. So maybe I'm just uh, skipping them and showing the final version of the history uh, of this function how it can look like 
um, uh, or let's say, yeah, let's do it again in a single step, everything. So this could then be the final um, solution here. Uh, first, let's try it out to, to see that it still works. Uh, okay, I forgot the offset, sorry. And I think also the sum, I need this guy. Okay, so it still works. And now uh, I try to scroll slowly. So in the end, I get this, this result here. So again, I produce this complicated function to a more or less one liner. Yeah. So it's really great to use ranges. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, that's it so far uh, for the examples. Then let me just briefly summarize. Uh, okay. Okay, to summarize, um, I've talked about um, how functional concepts can uh, improve C++ code and I've showed, uh, or I've specifically I've talked about how um, uh, the, the concepts making, using constants in the code, using pure functions and using uh, specialized algorithms and adapters and ranges. And if you want to apply more functional concepts, um, in C++, there are also a lot of libraries available for this. In Boost, for example, you find some more. And yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention and for coming. Thank you, Georg. Any questions in the audience? Irgendwelche Fragen here? Good. I'm interested, did you ever try profiling the new expressive functional code to uh, compare with the, with the older one? No. Like, no? Okay. no, I mean, yeah, that's why I also specifically said it's, it's about uh, writing expressive code. So uh, I, I don't consider it all performance so far, but um, it doesn't, uh, so I think in general, um, yeah, you cannot, you cannot have a general statement about whether it's more efficient or not. In some cases, it's it's uh, obvious that it's more efficient because of this lazy evaluation thing. But there might be also um, other yeah, situations where it's less performant. So I guess in the end, you have to to measure on a case by case basis. It can also be more performant. I've seen it be more performant as well. So you really need to benchmark it. Yeah.